Hello everyone and welcome to our research week event on neuromorphic engineering. Alternative technologies inspired by biology. We're here at the lovely Warrington South Campus of Western Sydney University. So let's go inside and we'll show you what we do. We're going to run today's event like an open day and give you a tour of our facilities and our research. We're going to talk about biology inspired sensors. We're going to talk about how we're trying to build computers that work more like the brain and how they process and store information and how we're using these technologies to solve real world problems because that's what we focus on here at the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems which is part of the Marx Institute here at Western Sydney University and today we're going to hear from our students and our researchers on some of the projects that we're working on these include self-playing pinball machines and robotic foosball tables how we're putting these cameras and telescopes on the ground to track space junk and we're putting these cameras in space to look back down at Earth. We're also going to hear how we're building uh, computer systems that can hear more like how humans hear with their ears. And how we're putting these cameras underwater to see what we can see, explore what we can do in the marine environment. But to hear more about that, let's have a chat with the director of the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems, Professor Andre Van Schaik. Hello, Andre. Hello. Welcome to our open day at the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems. My name is Andre van Schaik, and I'm its director. We would love to take you on a virtual tour of our lab today. First up, you're probably wondering what neuromorphic systems are. Well, neuromorphic means we're learning from neural systems in biology, such as eyes, ears, and brains, and applying what we learn to electronics to build smarter devices. Why would we do this? Well, take, for example, a mosquito. It only has a tiny brain. But if you've ever tried to catch a mozzie that's keeping you awake at night, you know how good it is at flying and avoiding getting caught. In fact, it's much better than any flying system we have ever built. On top of that, the energy it consumes is about the energy contained in a single grain of sugar. So they are very efficient. By taking inspiration from biology, we aim to build highly capable and efficient electronic devices. So we develop a host of sensors inspired by biology and algorithms that process the data we get from them. Today, we will show you some of these sensors and how we use them. Because we want to show how good our neuromorphic systems are, we are always looking to apply them to real world tasks and problems. Because of that, we do a significant amount of our research in partnership with industry and government. You might not realize this, but the group we have here at Western Sydney is one of the leading groups in the world. On top of that, we have partnered with the other leading universities in the field to have access to the best minds in the world. I hope today we can convince you of the interesting research we do and that it is worth looking to understand neural systems in biology to build better electronic devices. Once again, welcome to the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems and enjoy your visit. Thank you, Andre. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the technologies you'll see today. And one of the most important ones that we'll talk about quite a bit are the event-based vision cameras or neuromorphic cameras or silicon retinas. They have a bunch of different names. And in fact, we have one right here inside this kiosk behind me. So these are biologically inspired cameras that work a little bit more like an eye than a conventional camera. So in a normal camera, you get frames of them and they take pictures. These cameras work completely differently. Each pixel on these cameras operates like its own independent camera. And what it does is it tells you when it sees a change. And if it isn't seeing a change, it doesn't give you any information. Now, what that means is that if I move my arm, you'll see it. But the moment I stop moving, there's no change anymore, and the camera doesn't produce any data. And the moment I start moving, you get all these interesting change events that tell you that those pixel saw changes. So it completely changes the way you do imaging. And the results in a bunch of really useful properties that make them perfect for doing tasks. If you want to take pictures, use a conventional camera. But if you want to do tasks, which is what biology does, a camera like this gives you a lot of potential to do it faster, to do it better, and to do it at low power. So each pixel of these cameras is independent and asynchronous, and they generate changes around the set point unique to each pixel. What that really means is some parts of, these, some parts of the field of view of this camera can be looking at very bright parts of the scene, and others can be looking at very dark parts of the scene. And they act as if they're completely independent, which means you can look at both what's in a room and what's outside the window at the same time, whereas a normal camera you probably have one in focus and one completely saturated. So what we're doing with these cameras is putting them in telescopes, for example, to track objects in space, because it's a fantastic application of them. 
We're also using them underwater, as Maurice will tell you a little bit later, to see what we can see underwater in the marine environment. And we're using them on our robotic pinball machines and robotic foosball tables to show how these fast cameras can give you real-world benefits. But before we do that, let's have a chat with one of my colleagues, Dr. Mark Wang, who's building neuromorphic hardware, so biology-inspired hardware, that processes information in a more brain-like way. And he's doing that to try and get towards the power efficiencies and the robustness of biological brains. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Wong and I'm a neuromorphic engineer here. So my research is neuromorphic engineering, deep learning, integrated circuit design. So my main research interest is investigate how the brain works and what we can borrow from the biological systems and uh, whether we can use that principle to build a better computer for everybody can use. And another particular research interest is to fight for the fight with the climate change because people know all the server farms they are power hungry they consume a lot of power maybe one third power of the whole global consumption and if we can work on that use the neuromorphic computing to replace the conventional server farm we can reduce the power consumption a lot so Mark, why will looking at how biology works in neuromorphic engineering, why will that reduce the power and help the climate change? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so you see, our brain consumes about 20 watts and it can do a very good job for the sensory perception tasks and whatever. But this will, in turn, if we use a GPU to do the same job, it cost hundred thousand watts to do the same job. And that's the, the main difference. So if we can borrow the biological principles to process all this data, we should be able to reduce the power consumption a lot. So these are the spiking neuron, uh, spiking neuron processors we have designed two years ago. So it can be used to simulate update up to one billion spiking neurons in real time. So it's basically a model of the brain on a silicon chip. Yes, exactly. And you designed that? Yes, I designed that. You laid every transistor up? Well, not exactly. I let the tool to do it for me. It's one certain nanometer process. It's not a state-of-the-art process because as a university research lab we are more interested in the computing architecture instead of using some fancy technology but the design can be ported to the state-of-the-art process like 5 nanometer. Currently we are working with Intel and we are working some large-scale spiking neural networks platforms. In the left in the window what you see is the waveform, we, what we call it. So it tells the, we know the, uh, the silicon chip have the clock cycles. So this tells the signal what they are exactly what they are doing on each clock cycle. And the other side is the, the code. Because the circuit become bigger and bigger, so we use the HDL, hardware description language, to describe the, the circuit. All right, now let's go have a chat with Dr. Ying Zhu about how we're using neuromorphic techniques and audio to build biologically inspired systems that can hear. Hello everyone, I'm Ying. I'm a postdoc working on neuromorphic auditory system hardware implementation and application. What I'm doing here is I'm building circuits to mimic how humans and animals perform auditory perception tasks and apply those for practical applications. Here example of a uh, 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 cochlear circuit um, running on a hardware platform, FPGA board. Uh, here we can see this is the input sound on the top, um, which is my voice now. And uh, the bottom window shows uh, um, the image of the sound. This is a cochlear chip, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, apply uh, this cochlear chip on uh, multiple applications, for example, sound localization and uh, 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 acoustic sense uh, uh, classification. Uh, and also, I'm trying to uh, apply those for practical applications um, and place this device to um, portable devices for multiple environment usage. So, Ian, how does this 
big board over here related to your little chip over here? Oh, this is, uh, 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 you can see this as a verification platform. So I'm just uh, um, prototyping all the circuits um, on a FPGA board because it's uh, commercially available. It can be easily programmed on the FPGA and verify the, all the functions. And um, well, I'm sure everything is uh, uh, ready. I just, uh, I just use the same design for a chip implementation. This can, can be used uh, uh, under ver uh, various environments. For example, like, uh, think about uh, in some scenario, human can't reach, like uh, very deep underwater or remote uh, forest. But uh, since we have this uh, hardware ear, we can place the ear there and collect data and do some uh, analysis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now to change tact a little bit, let's talk about some neuromorphic applications. I'm going to start off talking about one of our most exciting applications of neuromorphic cameras, how we're putting them into space. So our project to put these cameras in space is called Falcon Neuro. And the goal of Falcon Neuro is to put two neuromorphic cameras onto the International Space Station to look for a very special kind of atmospheric phenomenon called a sprite or a transient luminous event. Now, to tell you what these are, I'm going to show you a video of the Earth from the International Space Station. And what you see here is all the lightning storms. Lightning hits the ground all the time from the clouds. Now, occasionally, however, the lightning doesn't go down from the clouds to the ground. It goes from the clouds up into the upper atmosphere, as you see over here. This is called a sprite or a transient luminous event. And they're kind of rare and really, really fascinating, a little unstudied. And the interesting thing about them is we don't really know what they do to the atmosphere how they're going to affect high altitude aircraft or our satellites or communication systems. And there's a lot of research that needs to be done to figure out how often these things happen and what their effects are going forward in space. Now, event-based cameras, neuromorphic cameras, the silicon retinas we build here in the lab are perfectly suited for this task because they're really good at capturing high speed and very bright events. Now, these sprites are really fast and very high and very hard to see from the ground. So we have a unique opportunity to put these on the National Space Station and look down and figure out how often these happen on the Earth's surface and whereabouts they happen. So what we're going to build is this. This is Falcon Neuro. It's a module with two event-based neuromorphic cameras in it that's going to be installed on the International Space Station. It has one camera that looks at the horizon and one that looks directly down. Now there's some really, really big advantages to putting these things on the International Space Station as opposed to a CubeSat or a little satellite in space in that if you put a satellite up, it's very hard to do anything with it. You basically just wait for it to come back to Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. Whereas if you put something on the International Space Station, you actually have astronauts up there who can look after it. You don't have to worry about power, you don't have to worry about communications. It's a really, really, really exciting research opportunity. And we are building this in the lab here. And just in a moment, we're going to go talk to one of my colleagues, Paras, who's going to show you the actual equipment that we're building and putting into space. Just to give you an idea of where this thing is going, it's going on the Columbus module of the International Space Station. Now that little park circle there in red, it's actually where the spacecraft, like the Dragon, uh, Falcon uh, 9 rocket and Dragon, or oh, sorry, just the Dragon, will drop up with the International Space Station when bringing this device up into space. Now I'm going to show you what a sprite actually looks like. This is a recording of a sprite from a high speed conventional camera. Now you can see from the time up there that it's going up in tiny, tiny increments. This is extremely fast. And this is captured, this is probably one of the best recordings I've seen captured from the ground. And what you'll see, it almost looks like an orange explosion. It's called a carrot survivor because it's carrot-like in shape. And you can see it has these weird tendrils that go up. You'll see it in a second over here. And this is the phenomenon we really want to study. We'll use these cameras to figure out how often this happens and what the effects are on spacecraft and the environment. So without further ado, let's go talk to Paras and we'll show you what this equipment looks like. Hi, uh, I'm Paras Gaki. I'm technical officer and working on ISS model. On this one, we are putting a camera over there. And this is the actual camera that goes in the uh, ISS station. And I want to quickly show you how it's captured on this one. So this is the live footage coming from the camera right now. 
So this is a live feed from the camera, from the neuromorphic camera that will go on the International Space Station. But this isn't how we're going to run it when it's in space, because we have to record as it goes around and transmit it back to Earth. Yes, exactly. You do that. So we are putting the two cameras over there, and so it will be capturing one at the, looking at the down to the Earth, and another looking at the horizon on this one. And basically, I want to show the, another video one, which is the recording of that previously did one. So this is a, in a 3D visual where we can see. So basically, I have created one video moving a hand in front of it. So I'll just look back again to see in a 2D visualization. Basically, we'll be putting two cameras on the Columbus model. It will be somewhere around here. And so this is the real size, actual size of the model that goes in the Columbus one. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, the eyes is really small compared to this one. Yeah. But it can take Lego. And yeah, and so piece. basically it will have like three sections on this one. So the bottom section will be ha have like all the PCBs, the uh, control system on that one, and the top will be like to the two cameras. So we can see one hole from the top camera. So we'll basically where we will be, there will be like even this camera on this one. You can see it from the top also. We have already one camera fitted on that. Excellent. And this is the inner section where the other camera goes one. So basically one will be look, looking at this direction and other will be looking on the other direction somewhere like in 70 to 75 degree. And this is scheduled to launch in November next year. Yep. Well, Paras, thank you so much. No worries. Fantastic. Really Glad appreciate it. it. So Paras is working on Falcon Neuro and that is where he sits and does all the testing. But let me show you where he actually builds the hardware. Let's give you a tour of the workshop where all the magic happens. Peek behind the curtain, take a look and see where we keep all the equipment and where we do all the work that goes into making these projects a reality. And this is our workshop. As you can see, it's a pretty large space and we have a whole bunch of really fantastic facilities here. We have a full electronics workstation, with soldering equipment, we have 3D printing facilities over there, a bunch of different 3D printers, places to do chip testing for the chips we make, a full telescope calibration facility now, and lots and lots of room for projects, and student projects specifically. Now let's go have a chat with some of our students, and we'll take a look at what they're working on. Now the first student we're going to talk to is Valerie. She's going to tell us about what she's doing to study how temperature affects the cameras we work with. So my name is Valerie mm -hmm. and I am a undergrad student of Western Sydney University and I'm currently completing my degree under the Bachelor's of Engineering Honours, majoring in Mechatronics and Robotics. Fantastic. And you're here with us doing your Capstone project? Yes, that's right. So I'm completing my final year project with you at the moment, um, which is characterising the effects of temperature for a neuromorphic camera. So when a camera gets too um, hot, we actually get a lot more events. They get like a lot of noise, pretty much. And when a camera gets um, cooled down, um, well, we're expecting it to have less, less noise. The ESCII is, um, is like a thermal chamber. So there's a neuromorphic camera inside it mm -hmm. where um, we do our experiments. So mm -hmm. that's our temperature controlled environment for mm -hmm. our neuromorphic camera. We're currently recording an LED blinking inside the temperature controlled environment, which is the ESCII at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is currently a cooled um, temperature. Mm -hmm. So we can see that um, well, we, if we hover over here, that we can see a lot, a lot of events. So that's the output of the camera. Yes, that's the output of the camera. So what are you going to do with that? So um, we're um, actually going to grab the data mm -hmm. for different temperature thresholds, which mm -hmm. is fifty-five degrees ambient mm -hmm. and um, zero degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Um, to, and then we pretty much plot the results to see the difference between the um, output of the neuromorphic camera, mm -hmm. hoping that we could see um, less events when mm -hmm. it's cold. Valerie, what do you want to do after you finish your research here? Alright, so um, I'm actually interested in doing a master's after this, so I'm looking forward to actually continuing this project because we do have, still have a lot more experiments to work on. That's exciting, isn't it? Yes, pretty exciting. Oh, fantastic. So, 
Valerie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Greg. All right, let's go and take a look at the rest of the lab. And I think that probably you might have noticed this unusual setup over here. This is an interesting pan tilt system, and it's modeling how two human eyes work. So we have two cameras that we put on here, one for each eye, and they can move like our eyes independently. And this whole unit here can move in a similar way to our head. And the idea is to study how we move our head and our eyes and how that may play into how we see the world around us. And by looking at how humans can see and do the tasks we can do, we want to try to use the neuromorphic cameras we've talked about today on a, on a system like this to study if that's a really good way for robots to see the world. So we get to play with toys like this as well. Now let's go have a chat with Michael. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. So, let's hear about what you're up to. So, um, I'm looking into the performance of the event-based cameras in terms of their speed and power usage. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of work has been done using the cameras in, in systems, but not enough has been done looking into how much power they use when they're connected in terms of inputs and outputs. So, understanding power consumption is really important, I guess. Yes, especially for space-based tasks and things like that, where low swap, low power is really important. The camera output is shown here, and then if we show that red what is screen, that? Yeah. What's me? <laughs> so we can see the individual pixels and the camera's only detecting the changes in the scene. Mm -hmm. And if we show that red ah. square motion, that LED turns on straight away and that's what we're looking for. So you're, telling, you're trying to figure out how much time it took from the camera seeing something in that red block mm -hmm. to turning the LED on. That's exactly right. Yeah. How fast is that? Well at the moment I've got it down to about 3 milliseconds. 3 milliseconds. Yeah. Which is, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so given that a normal camera a frame takes, what, 30 milliseconds to oh, come yes, out the camera? Yes, yes, yes. So we're extremely fast. Exactly right. Oh. So uh, the idea here is that we're breaking into a cable just mm -hmm. so we can take the power and the ground mm -hmm. parts individually. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put these into a little breadboard that I've soldered mm -hmm. here. And we're going to measure the current flowing through the cable just to get an insight to how much power is being used by all components of the camera. Then separately, we're going to measure the power of this circuit. Mm -hmm and the power um, coming into the circuit from another element of the experiment. So, I guess one of the things that are interesting about these cameras is that sometimes they're generating no events, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're generating a lot of events. Exactly. Do you expect the power to be different between those two? I do, actually. Um, I, I'm yet to figure it out, but... Well, that's the research, That's right? the research. That's the exciting part. What's next after this? Well, um, I'm actually about to finish my undergrad degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about starting a master's project and hopefully continuing this to learn a bit more. And there's, there's so many more prospects that can come after this once we figure this out. So you wouldn't mind sticking around if you can? No, I wouldn't. It's, it's been very exciting. Fantastic. Well, let's see what we can do. Thank you. There's lots of exciting stuff left. Michael, thank you so much. That's all right. All right, let's go on and take a look at some of the other things going on here in the workshop. If you look over here, you'll see our mechanical workshop. We have CNC machine a whole bunch of tools. This is where we actually build the frame and the larger, some of the larger projects we work on. One of which is affectionately called the toaster. And this is over here. This is our drone simulator platform. It stands for the Tactical Obstacle Avoidance System Testing and Equipment Rig. A little bit of a contrived acronym. But essentially what it is, it's a way to test algorithms and drones without having to worry about actually flying real drones. Although that's fun, it's actually really difficult to do. If you want to do experiments with drones, they're hard, they're expensive, they're hard to fly, and it's really hard to do repeatable, reliable experiments. What this platform lets us do is simulate a drone. And we can simulate how the drone moves by pulling on these strings, each one of which is connected to a motor in the corner. So by pulling them in different directions, we can move this drone around the space. And lets us do things like simulate and repeat experiments over and over again. One of which, for example, is this idea of high-speed obstacle avoidance. So, for example, I could take some tennis balls and throw it, and we'll have an event-based camera on top of this drone that will move them out of the way really, really quickly. This, obviously, is an important problem for real-world drones and using them in cluttered environments, especially with other drones around. So let's have a chat with one of our other students about some exciting ap agricultural applications of these sensors. Hey, Sammy. How's it going? Hello. Yeah, not too bad. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. So, Sammy. Can you tell us who you, who you are and how you fit into our CNS? So yes, of course. Um, my, uh, like my name is Sami, and I'm uh, like an FE student at the International Center for ne like Neuromorphic System. Um, my project mainly involves in agricultural application using the event-based camera. 
um, like mainly we, uh, the, the, like the project involved in detecting the fruit in a cluttered, like, like in a cluttered and uh, like dense environment. So the camera will be moving in it, in it, like dynamically, and then we're looking to uh, detect and know where the fruit are against all the leaves and all the background. One of the prominent problem is that uh, we're looking at very complicated environment and we're looking at multicolored objects. It will be really easy for me to know where they are and to know how uh, I'm gonna be able to pick it because um, in in my mind I already know that the color of the tomato is red. So taking inspiration of this idea, um, um, I'm going to use an event-based camera that have the capability of detecting the color. So that will be another feature to let the camera detect where the tomato is and how different it is from the background in order to do the uh, fruit picking activity. So the color will be another feature um, which we will be able to differentiate between the object in the agricultural application. Uh, the advantage of the event-based camera they, that they are biologically inspired of the, uh, of the human retina, they offer uh, like very uh, technical advantage. They, uh, they only generate data when needed or when, or like when the objects are moving and they are low power devices and they offer capability in, in, in high speed detection because the temporal resolution of the camera are in microsecond and we look into using the event based camera to be able to detect the, uh, like, like they detect the object in a way in much better than being done using the frame based camera. Thank you so much Sammy. Alright, let's head back. If you are interested in doing research with us we have a whole host of opportunities available, including master's and PhD scholarships. So if you are interested, please go to our website at www.westernsydney.edu.au slash ICNS and click on the opportunities page. Feel free to also suggest your own ideas and research programs and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So we've talked about neuromorphic sensors and we've talked about neuromorphic computing. That's the work Mark showed us about the hardware he's building to process in a biologically inspired way. And what brings these two together are the neuromorphic algorithms and the applications that we're exploring with these cameras. That's really what links the data we produce from these sensors to the way we can process them in a brain-like way. And one of the applications that is really, really exciting is putting these on telescopes to track objects in space. Now, we've spoken about how we can put these telescopes in space on the International Space Station to look down on Earth and track and detect sprites. But this is going the other way around. This is putting these, telescope, these cameras on telescopes on the ground to look up and track satellites in space. We can even track the International Space Station this way. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, it turns out that we've been putting objects in space for a very long time, and it's getting pretty crowded up there, which means that the risk of collisions between space junk and other satellites, and even crewed spacecraft, is growing every day that we put another object up. And we have to do something about this. And the first step is to track where these objects are in space. So it just so happens that when we put event-based cameras on a telescope, and this was just a wild idea we came up with to see what would happen, we discovered they provide a unique way to track and detect objects in space. Here's a picture of some of the telescopes that we've been using to do this. Now, we started off with some small telescopes like this, and we did some experiments that were really exciting, and this has grown and grown over the years until we produced a whole mobile containerized dedicated observatory called the AstroSight, and you can see it over here. So this is a shipping container with the telescope observatory built into it. The roof slides off, the telescopes rise up, and it can point in the sky and track satellites using the neuromorphic technology to do things you can't do with a normal telescope or camera equipment. Really, really exciting work. Now, just to give you an idea of what the data looks like out of this, on the left you can see a frame-based output from this camera, and on the right you see this really interesting plot that rotates. What that's really showing you is the raw data out of the sensor, the events that we saw earlier. And you can see how different a static 2D image that you see on the one side there compares to the stream of events and how much more information there is. In this case, we're actually following a satellite as it crosses across the sky. And that's generating a stream of events. And what you see flying through the field of view there are the stars. So this is what the data looks like when you come out of these cameras. And we've been working on this for a while. We built it up and up. And to give you an idea where we are now, this is kind of the cutting edge work we do. In this case, we're following a satellite with one of these cameras, and that's on the top panel there with the red circle. That's showing the satellite we're tracking. As we're doing that, we can build up a map of all the stars in the background and produce this rich star map that we can use to figure out exactly where we're looking in space. This lets us do things that are really exciting. 
imaging whilst we move the telescope around the sky. So just to give you some idea of some of the other things we can do with this, here's a great little example of recorded this. This is the moon with an event-based camera. On the one side, we have the events from the camera. On the right-hand side, we have some reconstructed grayscale. And you can see the moon there. But what you're seeing past in front of the moon are some clouds. Now, the clouds are actually helping us. They're inducing changes. And what that means is that we actually see better with the clouds as they move past. And we looked at this and we thought, this is lovely, but can we figure out a way to separate the moon from the clouds in this image? And it turns out, because of the way the data comes out of these cameras, we can. And here's an example of that. On the top left, you can see the clouds, the raw data from the sensor. On the bottom, you can see the image of the moon slowly forming as the clouds move past. And the right-hand side, you can see an image of the clouds themselves. So this was really exciting, and this is something that lets us do astronomy when it's lightly cloudy. But this is also a really example, good example of how we took an idea from the space domain and built an algorithm that we can use on Earth. And what we did here was essentially a project we call Seeing Through the Bushes. So we built a stick wall in the lab that you can see over here. We put the camera on a platform that can move backwards and forwards behind it. Now as the camera moves, it can see through all the little gaps in the sticks and piece that together to create an image of what's on the other side. If you use a normal camera, this is what you see. You can't see the sticks, it's not really easy to see what's going on. But using this camera and these algorithms, as you look through the sticks, what you'll see at the bottom here is two pictures forming. One, you can see Saeed standing over here, in the, one of our colleagues, standing in the lab. And the other one, you can actually see the structure of the room and some objects on the table a bit clearer. What we're essentially we're doing is we're leveraging the fact that it's parallax, that objects further away move more than objects close to the camera. And we can actually separate the scene into these two parts, this near field and this far field. And this is a really exciting technology, and it kind of ties back to what Sammy just talked about in terms of the agricultural applications. And this is some of the work we're using to see if maybe we can see fruits on trees better by moving in front and trying to see what's in the side of foliage. You simply can't do this with conventional cameras. So another application that's a really interesting potential to us is underwater applications of these sensors. And I think the perfect person to speak about that is Dr. Moritz Milder, who we have here. Hello, Moritz. Thank you, Greg, and also welcome from my side. You just saw that we can shoot for the stars and use new morphic cameras to observe the sky, detect satellites, and track space junk. Now, we will dive together underwater and see what we can detect using new morphic cameras in our ongoing project, Deep Blue. In this project, we aim to use the amazing features of new morphic cameras to detect air bubbles, fish, and other sea life. But more importantly, we aim to detect event patterns produced by wave motion and marine pollution. This is a very challenging task using conventional cameras, as motion leads to blurred images, especially underwater where we don't have much light. This will help us to clean up our ocean, but it will also enable us to detect the stars and the moon through the water surface. You may wonder, why do you need to do this? If we go from our home to our holiday destination, we use Google Maps and GPS to know where we are and to know where we need to go. If we dive underwater, however, GPS doesn't work anymore. If we can detect the stars and the moon and know their position, we can calculate our position anywhere on this planet. We are at the very beginning of this exciting research adventure. We built our first prototype and we were able to see air bubbles produced by me at home in my bathtub rising to the water surface. In a second experiment, we were able to see through the waves uh, as we submerged the camera in water, as you can still see me and the background tree as the waves are breaking over the camera. We are thrilled to go down this novel research avenue to understand the capabilities of neuromorphic cameras underwater. Thank you so much for your attention and have a great day. That is exciting, Moritz. Thank you. All right. Let's take a little walk over here and talk to one of our PhD students, Yesh, about a really exciting project. Hello, everyone. I'm Yashwant, um, and I'm a PhD student at ICNS, the Marx Institute. So this is a pinball machine. So it's, it's, a, it's a really old, refurbished, um, mechanical pinball machine that we have tried to come up with a robotic pinball machine just using using the old ones that we used to have at the old arcade shops. 
So this has uh, a variable lighting system, uh, a LED system, which, which can change the intensity of light falling on it. And there are a couple of flippers, as you might already be um, familiar with a, with a pinball machine. And then we have a, a neomorphic camera up there, which is looking directly at the, at the, at the board. And we try to run it using, using uh, the camera as a vision system. So what about it is roboticized? So the flippers are completely automatic. We can use a laptop or a, or a PC to run them whenever you want. The entire thing is continuous, so you constantly get the feed from the neuromorphic camera, and then you can use that feed to process the information and then actively act on the, on, on the board. What about pinball makes it a good problem to solve? Two things. So one, you need to be really fast to solve or to play pinball because you're constantly having a fast moving object and you need to act in real time. And second thing, it's quite simple. You just have two flippers. You either flip right or left whenever the ball reaches the bottom. And then you try to score as much as possible. Uh, so because it's pinball, you have a score. Yeah. And I guess the better you score at pinball, the better your algorithm is at playing pinball. Exactly. And the best part, we can we can let humans, I mean us, mm -hmm. play the pinball and we have recorded the score, how much we can, we can score on the table and then we can match those scores against the ones that we are, we are trying to develop here, the uh -huh. algorithms which are going to, if, if we, we are going to see if those scores match, if we can beat humans or not. So we can compare algorithms with other algorithms and algorithms with humans. Yes. Ah, exactly. that's a fantastically yeah. interesting way to look at it. So tell me a bit about the box. What does the box do and why do we have these very dramatic curtains? Yeah, so, so we have a lot of things going on around here. We have, we have a light system which can change and we have uh, different lighting conditions that we want to control mm -hmm. and test all these algorithms at different parameter levels. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we would like to conceal the entire, mm -hmm. uh, we use these curtains to, to block mm -hmm. any outside light so that we can have a perfectly controlled environment mm -hmm. where we can control the different variations in the, in the lighting environment and then we, we, we test these, uh, these characteristics in the whole thing. Yes. And I, I guess a human, can play in a dark arcade or a very bright arcade and it doesn't really affect us, right? Exactly. And um, So I imagine conventional algorithms and computer systems, they don't do so well with different lighting conditions like that. Yeah, so, so the main problems with the conventional computer vision systems is if, if you try them to work in one particular setting, they just work in that setting mm -hmm. and when you change anything slightly mm -hmm. in, the, in the environment, they start to fail. We want to overcome that by by training it with different levels mm -hmm. and also testing them in different conditions so that we can we can confidently say that this system mm -hmm. can work in these 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 conditions so how does this relate to your phd though oh so so my phd project mm -hmm. is to apply reinforcement learning on on this pinball machine so the aim of my project is to make the machine mm -hmm. learn on its own how to play pinball mm -hmm. without any hu human supervision, mm -hmm. just by using the score as a teaching signal. Okay, so you wanted to learn how to play pinball without anyone teaching it. It must learn from just saying, how do I get a good score? Exactly, so that's, that's how we learn as mm -hmm. humans, right? So when we try to do a task, mm -hmm. Probably when I was young, my mm -hmm. mom used to give me a chocolate whenever I used to perform better at whatever mm -hmm. that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that is a reward for me. And mm -hmm. I, I try to get that reward again and again. So I repeat the tasks that I was doing, which used to give me the reward. Ah. And now the score of the pinball machine mm -hmm. is a reward like that. And it has to just learn how to play these actions, mm -hmm. left flipper or right flipper, and it just constantly looks for that reward. Mm -hmm. And whenever it gets that reward, it learns that, oh, doing this action at this point of time would mm -hmm. give me a reward. And forgive me if I'm jumping ahead here, but from what I remember seeing, you don't necessarily have to stick to the rules of normal pinball. You can change things up. You got that right. We actually do a lot more than just just uh, playing with one single ball. We can add more balls uh, for that uh, mm -hmm. for that matter. And it is extremely difficult for a human to play beyond three balls mm -hmm. running around in the maze. And then as you can see, there are a lot of distractors on the board. Mm -hmm. There are flashing lights. There are, there are some there are some places where the, the ball disappears and appears back again. So mm -hmm. all of this 
adds up to that challenge and it, it, it makes it more and more difficult to, to, to try to learn this. Mm. But we as humans are really good at it. Mm. So which is why we are trying to emulate the, the biological neurons in our mm. brains and try to use those models to be able to achieve this sort of a robust performance on this uh, it's, an, it's an exciting pressure. Yeah. Thank you. So I have one more question for you, Yash, before I let you go. Yeah. Why is it important to teach machines and robots and neuromorphic systems to learn? What, what, what is, why is this something we need to do? We are really good at dealing with a range of tasks mm -hmm. and also being able to deal with that uncertainty mm -hmm. in the environment around us. Mm -hmm. And it is very important for the robotic systems that we are building in this world mm -hmm. to be able to be robust mm -hmm. and be resilient to the changes in the environment. And as you can know, if you, if you, if you give a small five-year-old boy mm -hmm. uh, the pinball machine, he will learn the machine, he will learn how to play pinball mm -hmm. within five minutes maybe. Mm -hmm. But f to achieve the same kind of performance, Mm -hmm. a, a, a machine or a, or a computer might take much, much more longer time and data to, okay. to learn these kind of things. So what we are trying to do is that try to develop robust, resilient and also quick learning algorithms mm -hmm. which can work in this real world and also behave like mm -hmm. or learn like humans. Fantastic. So, do we have to worry about the robots taking over yet? No. Ah, we're a long way off, aren't we? We're a long way. Yes, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep my eye open. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you That's so fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. All right. Hello, Alex. Hello, Greg. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex, and I'm a postdoc here at ICNS. I work mostly on even based computer vision and these cameras. I'm really interested in the potential applications on different systems, including, well, this one. Yeah, I can't help but notice that you have a robotic foosball table. Absolutely. And what's really interesting here is that only half of the table is equipped with motors that can move the players around. The other half is meant to be played by humans, so we can have a human compete against our system. The system has a bit of an advantage in that the camera on top gives it an overview of the whole scene, and we have a nice little ball tracker that helps us find where the ball is and move the players accordingly to score. If you look at a very realistic system like that, you don't have the time to be perfect. If you take 10 milliseconds to find where the ball is, it's already too late, you've already lost. So you need to find a way to be really fast. And the way we do it with these cameras inspired by biological vision, such as insects, for example, is to be sort of dumb in a sense you are doing pure reaction, but so quickly that you can actually be fairly good at a game like that with a very simple algorithm, just move the players in the way in front of the ball. We've looked at recordings of pro players. You have less than 20 to 30 milliseconds between the moment the ball leaves uh, the attack row of players and the moment the ball is in the goal. So um, normal cameras just couldn't do that task? Exactly. Uh, so you would need either an incredibly fast camera, but that's an insane amount of data, or you need something like this. Mm, of course, because it takes time to process data, so the more data you capture, the slower your system has to be. Whereas neuromorphic cameras, I suppose, give you the advantage of being fast and producing less data. And I guess it's interesting because a five-year-old can come up to this table, have never played foosball before, and in a few minutes learn the rules of the game and learn how to play. This is surprising, right? Yeah. Uh, we are surprisingly good at solving this problem, and yet it's an incredible challenge for computer vision, conventional computer vision. And we don't know yet if it's going to work, right? But this is why I think it's so interesting to tackle this problem with a different approach, right? Neomorphic engineering. In neomorphic engineering, we explore this new option, this new way of doing artificial intelligence based on this idea that it's, uh, biology is so good at solving all these problems and hoping that on the long run, um, this is going to help us build a fundamental different generation of robots. Uh, so we start from the ground up. Um, instead of starting slow but smart, we start fast and dumb. And we hope that layers and layers of that are actually going to yield very useful systems. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Really, really cool. All right. 
I think now's a good time to have a question and answer session. So please, if you haven't already typed a question into the chat, do so now and we'll answer as many as we can.